And she looked at me as though I had grown a second head, and she said, Bob? This was the monologue that they cut. I said, Elaine, don't worry. I, too, am no stranger to love on the clock. As a young lad, my father apprenticed me to a honey factory in Belize. The chief beekeeper was this horrible hag of a woman with gnarled teeth and a giant wart that she called a nose. Ooh, she was not attractive, even by backward standards. But love is truly blind, Elaine, and as the days went on, working closer and closer together, the sweet smell of honey in the air, I knew I had to have that horrible creature. And I did. So you and Bob have a good time tonight. Folks, before we start this episode, if you could do one thing, would you please hit that subscribe button? It really helps us out. Well, kick those tires and start that fake fire. It is indeed time to camp. Today we welcome a silver sage, a man so filled with wisdom that if he were to unleash it here upon the fire, we would find the universe could not contain all the golden nuggets. Who am I speaking of? An actor, a singer, a composer, a man who uttered the timeless wisdom, you're never more of a man than when you have a quarter pounder in your hand. I am speaking, of course, of John O'Hurley, a man who had a small and notable role on some fringe show called Seinfeld, and we welcome him here to the fire today. John, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. That was very nice. Um, appreciate the warm welcome and the rather sparse introduction. I think you could have done a little better. So if you don't mind, I'm going to start again. Okay, please and, take it away. Um, I'll reintroduce myself. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the man who killed Seinfeld. <laughs> In a career that began some 40 years ago with a badly lip-synced version of The Yellow Rose of Texas for a KTEL record commercial of Mitch Miller's greatest hits. Since then, he's managed to kill three series of his own. Four soap operas. He's guest starred on more than 50 television shows. Not one is still on the air. And during sweeps, the golden week of ratings, he managed to take not one, not two, but three shows off the air in one week. Ellen, Seinfeld, and Damon. Ladies and gentlemen, the Grim Reaper of television. John O'Hurley. Thank you. Thank you. That's an introduction. I got to say, John, I've never been one-upped, let alone ten-upped, on an introduction. Um, so that's you just kind of winged that, right? That was just all top of it, stream uh, of consciousness, it, it, right? It, it, it comes from um, looking in the mirror and um, winning a staring contest with your own reflection. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> a man after my own heart. John, one of the first questions I have to ask is, you have you have worked with, and by your own admission, some of the top talent. You've mentioned several times that you were on the championship team. You followed Michael Jordan. Of course, I'm speaking of, you've worked with Seinfeld and Dreyfus and, and, and Michael Richards and, and Jason Alexander. And in the two minutes you've been on this show, could you authoritatively say that you would probably count this as, as much of an honor as that will be, most likely? Uh... No, not at all, actually. Not at uh, all. I see. I had to ask. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to take your shot. Mm -hmm. This is going to be part of the slow descending spiral of my career. Fantastic. Well, now, do you find that when you do kill shows that the people... So, well, is that basically the end of my career then as well, since I'm having you on? It's a giant sucking sound, yeah. Okay. I pull everything down behind me. Fantastic. Well, I think we got... What we're. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, well, on a, on a brighter note, <laughs> that's, so uh, now that we've managed to suck the joy out of this entire time together, that's yes, right. right. In fact, it's actually a really good uh, COVID defense mechanism. If you suck everything out of the room, there's no viral load. So we it, are. That's exactly right. Bingo. So we are set to go. So I do have to ask um, a favor. At some point in the show, I would love you to coach me. I do a solid B minus Peterman, oh. and I'm told that you actually do a, a decent Peterman. I've, uh, on occasion i've been told i've been told it's it's up there that's up there all right mm -hmm. so we, we can get to that but i do want to start too because you're such a, you are the world's you are the original world's most interesting man i know the seventh most interesting. i know you said seven but, but i know it depends on which ranking i know there's various ratings well i know that on any given day there's only six people having a better day than i am that's true that's true and uh, and 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 i'll tell you when uh, bruce jenner became caitlin jenner i i didn't move up okay <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I was having a better day than you, and I'm not now. So I don't know. You might have moved up in the rankings now. <laughs> now, I do want to ask, I'm always curious about you were, so you're, you're a Maine man. You're from Maine, but New England through and through. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I'm a New England boy. Yeah. yeah. What were you like as a child? Did you, when you, looking back now, I guess a better way to put it, looking back now at who you were as a young child, could you see any chance of becoming the seventh most interesting man in the world? <laughs> Are there any, were there any signs early on of clothing magnet singer no, opera? Well, no, not, not any of that stuff, not the, not the trappings of it, but I think the internal workings of it. Yes, I, I was, I was a very thoughtful child. In fact, parents, uh, um, the, the mothers especially in the neighborhood said he's always he always looks sad and I was never sad I was just always thinking I was a very contemplative child and, and things mattered to me and uh, you know I would spend a lot of time alone thinking and observing and allowing things to affect me and um, I was always composing in my head writing writing in my head uh, you know so it's, it's so I guess all of the trappings of that of, of a of an artist I guess uh, an applied artist um, were, were there in, if, as I look back on it now I you I think you have a phenomenal memory um, which I'm gonna hold you to because you're gonna remember how amazing the show was but <laughs> you uh, did you did school come easy to you I'm curious because I think I'm, I'm no one is saying this except me so don't run with this but I think you you strike me as being rather intelligent now I've only been interviewing you for a couple of minutes um, but I've used, I've seen you use multi-syllabic words and recite things verbatim. Mm -hmm. Did you have a good memory as a kid? Were those gifts present early there, on? There were things that were. I would remember things that were meaningful, but I wouldn't say I was a great student. I know a mul I knew a multitude of things that were mostly wrong. <laughs> Do you still know a multitude mm -hmm. of things that are wrong? Oh, I'm listen. My my son at the age of fourteen, my son is amazing me at how much uh, he can best me. Is it? Do you, I find this too when I was uh, with some of my nephews and they're going through classes now and I think, you know, first through third grade, I'm pretty good. I can help them. The home. Some of the math they're starting to do early well, on, I'm, I am, I'm going He's out. into, uh, you know, he's in um, um, ninth grade right now, but he's doing pre-calculus already. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm out of that. I'm, he, he has long since surpassed me. And then you meet these young kids, and it's like, oh, I'm working. I was with a friend of mine, and her daughter just got accepted at um, some little college, uh, Harvard, some tiny. It's a very little small promising, arts, small arts school. Young school yeah. yeah, and they uh, and she's doing a degree in robotics hmm. and Mandarin, um, but she had started Mandarin well, in high that's school because that's the, all of the instructions are written in Mandarin, so you <laughs> can't right. do robotics unless you. That's right. Mm -hmm. But see, I plan on using AI to <laughs> build my robotics for me. So I'm just, you know, ahead of the game there. But uh, she was, uh, I've, and, I, I've, and I found myself equal, equal parts impression, uh, impressed in revulsion and envy. I don't, I don't often find myself envious of, you know, you know, 17 year olds, but uh, it was, I was like, wow. I'm well, they're just exposed to an awful lot of stuff that we're not. And um, I mean, there's just no question that my son has, has a plethora of information that is just, you know, I, I, it just wasn't mine. And I went to a very, one of the better private schools, I would say, um, in the entire New England area. Uh, but I just, I, I didn't grasp things as he does. Mm. Uh, I was more of, um, you know, he's more of a, uh, a binary, you know, this, 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 this. Uh, I was more of an essay. You know, I was more, more addicted to thought than the right answer. So for me, school didn't, I, I wouldn't say school came easily. But I also wasn't as interested in school. I was interested in theater. At the age of three, people would, large people would stand over me and ask me the same question over and over again, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I, uh, with a sense of disgust that only a three-year-old can muster, I would put my hands on my hips, I would point to the black and white TV in the corner of the room, and I would say, well, I am an actor, so that's what I'm going to be. And so, at the age of three, I knew exactly what I, it's not that I, and it's not that I wanted to be an actor, it's that I was an actor. So I already knew it. And every time I watched television, I knew that I was supposed to be there. And um, no matter what show I watched, I knew that I was supposed to be there. And so, for me, growing up was really just about connecting the dots between that child and where I am today. 
Now, I have to ask, since you have this flair for the dramatic, do you have any, uh, hmm. did you ask, did you have any prom, did you ask your date to prom with any cool gestures? Or no, any? my uh, my date to prom asked me. Oh, really? Yeah, I was a Very senior. Very progressive. I was, a, I was a senior, she was a sophomore because I was very shy. Oh really? With women, I was very shy. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was actually going to ask. You know, yeah. does how how were you with? Well, the, I was a very sensitive child, so the idea of being turned down was probably more than I could have, <laughs> I could bear. <laughs> and when did you? But I, uh, I did. I mean, I, I I went to the dances when I was in school, but I, but uh, senior prom, yeah, a sophomore asked me because I hadn't gotten around to asking anybody else. So that actually worked out ahead of the game because you know they you know, they say sometimes you know men will date younger women. She you know. She did. She got the clout of going with a senior, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to. The, oh, I went with a younger woman. And yeah. she was also very popular socially, so within the school. So, it um, you know it it, it filled a, a very important uh, <laughs> role for her. Okay, so you did opera, right? You studied opera. Well, I, I studied I studied voice operatically. So okay. um, and yes, I did uh, when I first went to New York. The first things I did were more operatic. Yeah, uh, bel canto opera. I think that was the first show I did was bel canto. Do you still sing today? Mm, oh yeah. Well, that's you know I have my one man show, my musical show that I do. I tour around the country. And, uh, that's what I did see that. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. It's. Uh, oh no, I still do. Oh, I never stopped. I never stopped. I'm still. I still study. I, I never stopped studying voice. That's me. Do you find um, how does I'm, I've always been curious as you as you get older, um, and I think you're approaching sort of mid forties now. And like, how does uh, <laughs> yeah yeah how yeah. does that affect the voice? Well, as you get older, um, the voice deepens, uh, at least in the man, uh, and it matures. Uh, the 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 vocal folds get thicker, um, and uh, you know I have a different voice than I did back when I was in my twenties. When I was in my forties. That you claim that I am, um, but um, yeah, it just it, the voice does change. It matures. It develops a richness. Um, but you have to be careful uh, as a singer as you get older, because uh, the voice will tire. It will strain more easily, um, and also you have to keep your vocal hydraulics uh, in good working order, uh, so that you can hold your line and your high notes and. So you're not you're not ACDC belting from the shower anymore. So. Oh no, I still I, I listen. I love to be surrounded by ceramic tile when I sing. It's lovely. That's right. It's a, I find it's a generous audience too. I find my reverberation is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, so you when you went out to New York, did, was that a I'm going to be I'm going to make it? Because I know you you were in PR. I just learned this about you. You mm. were in PR prior to uh, acting and. Was this something that was going on in the background, and then there was a moment where you said, "I am going. To, this is it. I'm going to do this." No, I'll take you back even farther. I, take me uh, back. I was at Providence College, which is a wonderful basketball school, uh, not so much a theater school. In fact, I was the only graduate my senior year in theater. So you were valedictorian of the theater I, department. Well, I'll put it even more succinctly. I won the um, I won the theater award. Congra yes, Congratulations! Is that framed on the wall still? Not really. It was okay. just a little note and a hundred dollars in it, so, <laughs> which was a um, lot back then. I just checked for a hundred dollars. Got me, yeah. Um, the uh, but I was scared to death of the business of acting. I knew what I was doing as an actor. I felt, but I had no idea how I could make a living at it. Uh, I had never been really to New York. I, maybe once or twice, even though I lived in Connecticut. Which sure, I lived in Connecticut, but I went to school in Rhode Island and. So I'm never more than two hours from New York, but I was never there. So I had no idea. I, I, I didn't, I had never gotten my street cred, if you will. Um, and, and I didn't know how to make a living at it. So I was scared to death. And I, I ran like a deer in the headlights um, from, um, from that whole idea. And I ran, went back home to live with my parents and, uh, and try to figure out what I was gonna do with the rest of my miserable life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, re I really had no idea and it was a, it was a source of depression for me because you know I had had so I had so much fun in college because I was in every show okay. and uh, you know performed at will and you know did my own one-man show and you know I, I was always performing well that stopped the day of graduation and now I had to realize what I was you know I had to go back and be an adult now and um, I don't know how to do that and I certainly wasn't going to be including theater in that because I had no idea how to make a living at it. So I 
found the next most theatrical thing I could do, which was advertising and public relations. But, you know, I started off by wrapping boxes at an advertising agency. Uh, so it wasn't particularly... Um, which you got high marks for, though, right? I went, to, I went to work every single day in a coat and tie. And when I got there, I took the coat and the tie off, rolled up my <laughs> sleeves, and I wrapped the boxes. But I would come to work every single day because I wouldn't allow myself to believe that I was wrapping boxes at an advertising agency. Wow. And so at lunch, when everybody went to lunch, I learned everybody else's job at the advertising agency so that any time they were sick, I could fill in for them. And that's how I jumped up the ladder very quickly. Uh, inside of two years, I was director of PR for Yale School of Medicine at the teaching affiliate at Waterbury Hospital. And um, um, from there, I went to the uh, top post at the American Red Cross for a couple of years there. But at the time, I realized I was not doing what I was supposed to be doing with my life. And I knew that I was, as I said, at three years old with my hands on my hips. I was an actor. And um, that's what I was supposed to be. And I knew I wasn't doing that. So I, uh, sadly, um, <clears throat> as a, a, very, a, a side tragedy came upon my life, I lost my best friend um, to a very horrific automobile accident one night. And he, um, it, it devastated me. One of the most, along with losing my sister at about the same time, um, the watching his example of living extraordinarily, and the fact that I was living ordinarily, and uh, not following what I was supposed to be doing, changed my life. So, in in order to come out the winning side of the tragedy, I made a promise to myself that in two years I would be in New York. Um, as a working actor and um, it meant going back and training again and um, every Saturday I was in New York City for um, a good solid year and a half and I never missed uh, and I kept that promise to myself that I was going to recommit I saved every penny I possibly could I downsized my life I drove in $400 Volkswagen around for a couple of years just to save money and um, I was in New York that September of 1981, and um, my father dropped me off at a single room occupancy hotel for $80 a week. A quarter of the bed was missing. I don't know what happened. It looked like somebody bit it off. And uh, <laughs> it was full of roaches, and it was a miserable place to live, but it was where I was going to live. And um, it's all I could afford. And I went to New York with $800 in my pocket, and uh, I got my first show. Um, 48 hours after I arrived, and um, I never looked back. I never had to do anything else but be an actor in New York. So you, what was the, uh, and you have a full bed now, right? Well, I try to, I still take a quarter of it off just okay. for, because it's, uh, I'm, the feet hang over nicely. That's right, yeah. okay, yeah, so that's what the sizes. You get, you get used to sleeping a certain way. That's right, I I've, I've figured. So when you got that part in New York, was that the beginning of financial stability, or was it still a? No, uh, I was always, I was sustaining myself, Got it. going from job to job to job. Uh, but I was lucky enough to be able, thanks to my experience in public relations and, and you know, being a trained speaker, uh, as I was with, uh, you know, going around the country speaking on certain things uh, from my past five years of experience in public relations, um, I was able to work in a lot of different areas. There, um, there was a great need for people to do what they call industrials, um, which were just basically business to business videos that they used, they hired actors for, and they paid extremely well. And uh, I was in that field as well. I did a lot of commercials, but I was always working as an actor. I never stopped. I never had to, do, I never had to do, be a bartender. I never had to be a waiter. It was always as an actor. And I prided myself on that, that that's what I was going to do. And, um, I will tell you a funny story as a side note. At one point, my bank account had dipped below the $10 mark. And um, I went to withdraw some money from the Actors' Equity, the credit union there, and I couldn't because if I did, they would have closed the account. And I said, oh no. So what I had left was a, a small bit of change and a subway token. 
and I had no idea what I was going to do because for the first time in my life I realized I was insolvent. It was past bankruptcy. I had no money. Literally no money. I had a subway token. Went over to Central Park that day and thought about what I was going to do and I said, well now I've got to break my rule and I've got to go find a job. And there was a copy of the Village Voice sitting on the on the park bench. And I opened it up, and at the time, that was the source of all classified ads and jobs and part-time things. I mean, there's nowhere else in New York you went to the Village Voice for your, if you needed a part-time job. Well, I looked there, and there, and in my naivete, I looked down there, and it said, hmm, male escorts. Hmm. And they were saying that they earned $1,200 a week, and I'm going, whew. I could do that. I could walk people around the city and show them. You know, I said it's an awful lot of money, but I could do that. And there were three or four of these, and some promised more money, some less. And I said, okay. So I said, all right, well, I'm going to, I was over there by the plaza there, the pond. Um, and I said, I put down the, um, I took that page that I needed, and I walked back up to 98th Street where I was living. And I walked in the door. And I was prepared to go shower up and head down to whatever my appointment would be from my male escort interview. Um, and I happened to hit the, um, the um, recording machine as it was beeping. There was a message there. And that's what you did back then because they weren't digital. I've heard, actually, I saw that in an exhibit recently. Yes, yeah, but they okay. weren't digital. And so I hit play and it, um, it said um, it was from my agent. And I um, had just booked the lead in Pirates of Penzance uh, for the national tour. So I went off on that. And, and so that saved me from being a male escort. <laughs> and you thought about returning to that, though. Well, you know, you, you, once, you, once you dip into that world, you never go back. That's right. You, know? you, gotta... so you just have... I'm No, not... <laughs> it was... It was very, and, and it wasn't... And I have to tell you, I still, for another year, had no idea what a male escort was. That's I had no idea. That's probably a good thing. Yes, it, well, it's a However, sign. I'm looking that's at... That's when you come when you come from New England, you come from a different... Uh, um, I'm talking about the rates. I mean, that's not a bad rate even by today's standard. I mean, if you're just touring, you yeah. know, if it, for the job description that you offered. No. Um, wow, that is amazing. Yeah. What was what was the big break? What, what changed things for you when you were like, I'm not just sustaining, I'm actually making it? Daytime television. Okay. Yeah, daytime. I was doing um, Broadway... Which was good. I mean, it would you know it was you earned good money pay, doing theater, on Broadway, off Broadway, out regional theater and stuff. You you were able to sustain. You weren't getting rich, but you. But then when I moved to daytime, I realized that you could take the decimal point and move it over one, and that was when you started earning six figures a year. And uh, I started off on the edge of night. Went from there to. Um, a show on ABC called Loving, where I was actually the first twin brothers on daytime. Uh, you have me to thank for that nonsense. And um, <laughs> and uh, then I went to all my children to uh, Santa Barbara to a uh, long time on uh, the number one show, the uh, the Young and the Restless. And so I I, I had about uh, oh about eight years of solid night or night or uh, daytime television, and that's. That's when I, yeah, I mean, that's when you were able to, and that was in, the, that was back in the, uh, in the 80s, which was really kind of the golden age of daytime television. That's when you could afford to get a real bed. Oh, right? a real bed, yep. yep. That's you right. didn't, uh, the full bed, yeah. That's in fact, right. you'd go in and ask for the full bed, and they said, would you like a piece missing? I yeah. said, no, <laughs> give me the full bed. That's right. And then you could, you could hire escorts this time. You wouldn't need to be one. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. That's right. Okay. And then, you know, I, I recall, so you were on some, there's a, it's a bit of a fringe show, sort of a cult classic, uh, I think it's called Seinfeld. Mm. Um, and I, and I love this story because you, you were actually, uh, you were not going to do it. Um, you were, well, you I had, had you know, I, in the nineties was when I moved from daytime to nighttime. And again, you can move the decimal point over one more time. The later uh, it gets, the better you do. The, the, be the better you did. Yeah, it was a, uh, you know, it was a, a big, yeah, I would say the late 80s and, and 90s were the golden age of situation comedies, and they were, um, you know, doing really well. And, and along comes, and in 1989 comes the show called Seinfeld, and I was still, you know, getting off my um, uh, uh, daytime television binge and moving towards nighttime. And finally discovering or allowing Hollywood discover that I had a sense of humor because they said, well, he only does. Is drama. that what that is? OK. He only um, he only can do dramas. So they wouldn't uh, you know, they wouldn't even see me for a comedy. 
Uh, so, but I did. Um, I did two sitcoms before Seinfeld. One was called uh, Scorch, uh, which was a very funny show, kind of uh, a, a, about a fire-breathing dragon um, in, con- in contemporary time. And then uh, from there, I, I went to a very, very funny show with a gr- one of the great casts that I've ever worked with um, called A Whole New Ball Game. And it was meant to parallel a show called Coach. I uh, remember Coach. Yep. Uh, Craig, Craig T. Nelson, yeah, yeah, Craig T. Nelson, and we same producer, same. So it was going to be the the bookend to that show, um, and it just never, for some reason, it just never chided. So we last three quarters of a season. They called on a Wednesday morning, said, "Don't bother coming to work." We pulled the plug. It's the way they do it. So I went out to dinner, crying in my beer, trying to take the cancellation as personally as I possibly could. And uh, Larry David's office had called while we were out to dinner with uh, my manager there and, uh, and said that they had this casting director said they had this part time or the, this um, um, guest star. Uh, uh, and they thought it was an interesting enough role that I could kind of chew it up and have fun with it. So um, I, I said to my manager, I said, tell them no. I said, I'm still licking my wounds off being canceled today. So I. Um, and I left things that night with him that he had called and canceled. He never called. And the following morning, he called me and said, I didn't cancel. They're waiting for you over there. Just go blow it out of your system. So I went over there. And, of course, Seinfeld is the most disorganized show on television. Uh, you know, they, they never had an episode fully written for the read-through. And uh, I went over there. And all they did was hand me a, a copy of the J. Peterman catalog, this very unique Hemingway style compendium of ladies and men's romantic wear along with a Hemingway style story uh, attached to it, which made almost no sense at all. And, uh, <laughs> but it was just such a bizarre thing. And they said, we want him to sound the way the catalog is written as though this stuff is just traipsing off his tongue with a price size and availability attached to it. And I said, oh, that's bizarre. And so as I'm reading the catalog, it occurs to me that it sounds a little bit like a 40s radio drama and a bad Charles Kuralt. So that was really the genesis of J. Peterman. And that was the idea of the character that he was this, and, and that he was this kind of Hemingway style poet that, uh, you know, with, with men's romantic and women's romantic wear. And, and, um, but as the time went on, um, he became, the, the writers had more and more fun with him, and he became an absolute raving corporate lunatic um, who just lost his mind, literally, and went off to Burma at some point to, to find himself, if you can imagine anything more insufferable than Peterman finding himself. Um, <laughs> but, it, 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 you know, I mean, the character through, the, through the, the arc of the five seasons, I think, that I was there, I don't never really count it, um, it, he developed uh, just a sense of the kind of surreal Mr. Magoodum. He yeah. was just Mr. Magoo all over. And uh, he always landed on his feet. But um, A brilliant buffoon. He was a brilliant buffoon. He really was. A legend in his own mind. That's right. I've, uh, I've been told that too. So. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, I do want to ask. So uh, before we get to any, um, is before we conjure him up like via the Witch of Endor, and bring Peterman back um, if he's around. Um, I'm curious, you know, just do you have any stories or just anything that stands out of of anyone with the cast of, you know, working? I mean, obviously, a lot's to be said. You've spoken at length about the passionate mediocrity that Jason Alexander mm-hmm. was able to channel. Well, I and think it, that was, yeah. And he is the most difficult character to play I, on that it, show. Listen, I, I think the success of, the, of, of, of Seinfeld was really in the hands of that character, George. Now, you could, I mean, because you can certainly Kramer was extremely important, and Julia was important, and, and but in the hands of any other, you know, kind of balding, pudgy yeah. character actor in the it, it, on television, that role would have been just another fat guy role, yeah. character role. But but Jason played that character with a passion. And I say passionately mediocre. He never wanted to be better than mediocre. Just swinging from the middle rung on the ladder of life was plenty for George. And that's what he did. 
And uh, it was so important, that character, to have because so much of every episode was about George's tour de force protection of mediocrity. And, um, and it was, I, 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 as I say, I look back on the show now and I go, that was the key to the show, among other things. But I would say, if you had to put your finger on one thing, that's what made that show so palatable to everybody. And just the rare combination of the gifts and, and, and the physical comedy of Michael Richards. I still, I've tried to enter a doorway the way he does. And oh, with the skid stop? Oh, he, well, Michael would practice at, at the Peterman set and was right next to Jerry's set. So, and I would live on my set. I, I had a dressing room, but I never used it. I had all of my stuff in the drawers of my desk, and that's all I ever needed. So when we're looking at you in the office, that's it's all. It's my office, and all the, the, the behind me, the... Everything is functional. The mini I've fridge with the $20,000 cake? Yeah, the, the $27,000 cake, yeah. It was, um, uh, everything functioned. I mean, I had all my stuff in there, my books, my, like that. Never moved. It never, it uh, was always there and I could, you know, stick my feet up on my desk and I'd stay there all day long. There's, there was no reason to go back to my dressing room. I mean, yes, I had a television back there, but you know, I had more fun sitting on the set and just talking to people and uh, working on my, you know, on the scenes and everything there. Uh, much more enjoyable than than uh, than sitting back by myself in my dressing room. So, That's yeah. Um, by the way, we're we're about six minutes away from five. Do you mind if I steal you for another ten minutes past sure. that? I mean, it's this is just too good of stuff. Because um, I've I've heard of this show and this is this is wonderful. Um, do you have any? Uh, I gosh, I, one of the things about Seinfeld that stands to you is, is the. So I have to. My favorite show of all time is actually Frasier. Mm. I, the writing on that is just and Kelsey Grammer uh, and David Hyde Pierce. They are just. I mean, mm -hmm. but one thing I feel that if Frasier has a weakness is is the co-stars are fine. There's some good ones, but Seinfeld had these characters that come in and I mean, I've been torn between trying to pick. I mean, you are my favorite. Uh, a co-star on that or the the, the or, I don't know what the technical term is but the the second place has always been a tie between Jackie Childs and David Putty and mm -hmm. I don't know how to there's no show that I mean that you just think about all the people they got brought in mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. just so amazing it, it, it you know it really well here's the thing is that it was a very unselfish group of writers if you look at um I mean I I did Frasier uh, as a, an episode of Frasier a, a good one uh, as Thomas J. Fallow, his drinking buddy from... Um, That's right, you wrote, yes, and you stole yeah, his novel. I stole his novel, yes. Or that, he I, refers to it, The Million Dollar Treacle And machine. you cry. It was, oh, it was the... Um, it was uh, a, basically a parody on the bridges of Madison County. That's right, and this, all the women were reading it and, and crying. Reading it and loving it. And, just, and, he was, you know, and he was sitting there going, this is the book that I basically... And he cornered you, yeah. and you started crying, and like, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He goes, oh, stop it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, what was wonderful about Seinfeld is that the writers were very selfish, unselfish towards the guest stars, and they gave them incredible stuff to work with. Um, I mean, you look at the stuff that I was given as Peterman, these long rambling monologues that were, you, you, you wouldn't as a guest star have that much interesting, peculiar focus uh, f uh, given to you. You know, everything would be kind of put, you, all you were doing was setting up the star for the joke. You know, if you look at Two and a Half Men, you know, the, the guest stars are really just there to, just to set up, you know, Charlie Sheehan for his one-liners. Uh, yeah. And it still works wonderfully, but I mean, that's what sitcoms were like. They, you were there to set up the star. Seinfeld was not that way. You were part of what was a funny, because Seinfeld's not funny. It's, yeah. it's the scripts are not funny. And this is what I had to get used to, was that the lines weren't funny. There were no jokes. Everything was about playing the scene as real and honest as you possibly could. And the scene will become funny especially when it's juxtaposed against the three other or the two other subplots that find, the, right. find their way crossing each other's path. But that was the genius of the show. It wasn't about set, 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 and deliver the punchline. Set, 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 and deliver. That was what, you, you, you want that, you go to Golden Girls. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or also some a other, great show. Yeah, but also, I mean, also, but that's that right. was the style, the predetermined style, the pro forma of what a situation comedy was. And that's what I was used to. It was like, set it up, pause, deliver the punchline. So I developed my sense of timing off the golden age of, of yeah. you know, you know, it was like, it just, you know, I would t find out where to take my breath, 
and go. And but when you go over to Seinfeld, uh uh-uh. uh, yeah, you gotta play the scene. Play the scene. And it's like it was it was more like a drama that was funny because you played it dramatically. And it was fun to watch your character evolve too, because even opening up with your that's right, I'm Jay Peterman and it just and then you look at contrast that to the the later scenes uh, with those mom. And I read a little anecdote that you inserted actually one of my favorite Peterman lines, um, when Jerry excuses himself uh, from dining and you tell uh, the uh, you tell George. Uh, no, yeah, that's what he says. That's yeah. right. I'll tell the Major D tonight's just the three bulls. It, tonight yeah. it will just be the bulls. The three, and you made that up on the spot. Yeah, that yeah, was. Yeah. It's cool that that channel. But it was nice. But but that the show was like that. They were very generous that way. Cool. And it was if it worked, throw it out there. And um, if it if it floats, will or sticks to the wall, you know, it, we'll we'll keep it in. They weren't, you know, they didn't say, oh, because you're a guest star, you don't get to, you know to play with us big boys you know there right. wasn't any of that it was a very it was a very selfless set it was it had to be funny everybody and and you look at and that was the temperament i mean you look at julia louis dreyfus one of the great physical comedians in the history of television and she would go down with the ship to get the laugh it didn't matter what she had to do you know i mean she would make herself seem so unattractive for the laugh you know the dance that she did with the, you know the oh the thumbs. little kicks the uh, yeah the kicks and the snaps of the uh, of the of the thumb. Oh. Uh, I mean, I mean, she would go. Uh, she was, she went to absolute extreme to make it funny, and that's a courageous because you're taking a big risk. You know, it's like it's it's thirty seven million people on the other side of that little black hole, and you know it's. That's a scary little abyss. Oh, it was so yeah. good, and it's so. Yeah. Well, I have to ask: Would you? Could you regale with a line of Peterman, and then could I actually attempt to try a line and see and have you critique it? Um. Well, probably the one that is. I I, I write a lot of monologues still because I'm on that. Cameo.com. I saw, yeah, Cameo.com for birthday yeah. greetings, etc. Yes, <laughs> like, yes, I know. I know. Uh, it's great. And, Kenny G is on there, and I'm going to have him compose it. something yeah. for me. Yeah, they, um, but, um, but there was a monologue that was actually cut from Seinfeld, and it was when Rob Schneider was playing my hard of hearing assistant. Bob. And I thought, um, I gave, I went into Elaine's office one day because I mistakenly thought that she and Bob were having a little tete-a-tete on office time. And so I decided that I was going to play Cupid. And I walk into her office late one afternoon and I slap down two tickets to the Karamazov Brothers Circus. And I tell her that she and Bob can knock off a little early to get ready. And she looked at me as though I had grown a second head and she said, Bob? This was the monologue that they cut. I said, Elaine, don't worry. I too am no stranger to love on the clock. As a young lad, my father apprenticed me to a honey factory in Belize. The chief beekeeper was this horrible hag of a woman with gnarled teeth and a giant wart that she called a nose. She was not attractive, even by backward standards. But love is truly blind, Elaine, and as the days went on, working closer and closer together, the sweet smell of honey in the air, I knew I had to have that horrible creature. And I did. So, you and Bob, have a good time tonight. There it is. And it's started. I don't even want to go. I should have gone first. <laughs> That was oh, fun. That, that, that is... was uh, funny stuff. Funny stuff. It went to the. Uh, actually, they put it in the uh, when they finally put the discs or the full set of uh, Seinfeld episodes. They went back and put that back in. So that's that's there if you uh, if you actually buy the disc set now and watch them. My, oh, that is so good. My, I, you were on, I came on the other day and you came on and you you came out and you were like this. Uh, Elaine, this air is curing me like a black forest ham. Elaine, and, yes, this yeah. air is. And the way you go, Elaine, and I was, just, I loved, I just, it was so <laughs> funny. And then you're like, nah, I love that too. Just that's one of my favorite memes. I guess. Well, I enjoyed it because for me, I was able to combine my vocal training um, with the sense of the that kind of poet on the cliff that I was able to play with. I would, I would sit there, and if you look at, if you actually look at the scripts that I had. I would have little arrows and ups and downs, and it, and it was like, and, and I would be able to say, I 
think not. That's right. <laughs> and then last night the cake one was on, and he's like, Elaine, do you know what happens to a butterscotch no, but frosting? No, yes. <laughs> Elaine, do you have any idea what happens to a butter-based frosting after six decades in a poorly ventilated British basement? <laughs> I have a feeling what you're about to go through will be punishment enough. Good day. I love it because you asked her, is the cake still with you? <laughs> <laughs> is the... Yeah. Do you have a, is there a moment that stands out on set that was just so fun? Or I, I love any Michael's, like, all the characters. I heard Michael Richards is just, a, 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 he's, you know, just he's in character and it's like he's just fascinating to work with. Well, yeah. Michael is an interesting person. He is. You gotta be. He <laughs> has, he has what I would call an artistic temperament. Um, if Michael is the type of performer, the type of artist that can could dream of the Salvador Dali timepiece dripping over the precipice. That takes a certain mind to think of that. But he has that mind. You know what I mean? It's not, it's, it's, it, it isn't so binary. Yes, this or this or this or this, you know? He just thinks of, okay, well, maybe, whoa, yeah, you know? You know it, and then you start to realize you can see, see Kramer in there and the Salvatore Dali type of, he, he, um, he thinks differently. And I used to love talking with him because um, no matter what we would talk about, he always had a different take on it. So, you know, I grew up with, you know, a very conservative, you know, New England background, and I saw things, you know, a certain way, you know, and, and, but he would always have a different take on it, and I always admired that, because I said, hmm, that makes me think differently, I like that, I like that, he was good mind, That's right. great people, I was lucky enough to put my finger through the belt loops of some great brands, that being one of them, and, uh, do you stay in touch with them? Uh, well, you know, I, you see everybody everywhere. So yeah. to say we stay in touch, no, not stay in touch. It's like we call up and, you know, you run out of things to talk about after a while, especially if you... you no, yeah. no, 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 no. But, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we see each other, you know, everywhere. So That's so cool. Small world. Well, as we, as we close out our camping trip here, I would love to, you know, you have... Uh, fantastic hair and there's there's a few grays in there some of it's real that's real, yeah so you don't you don't you don't spray it's not a it's real gray hair um i would love to get some wisdom uh, from you because you've you've outed yourself as being older than 40 so ostensibly mm -hmm. you have some lessons that you've collected from living on several dimensions of beds over the the decades i'd love to ask you uh, I love how you talk about marriage. Uh, you are uh, so praising of your of your wife. I think you mentioned at one point a scratch golfer, bombshell blonde. Oh, um, I hate my life. Yeah, it's absolutely terrible. I'm curious I if have there's to roll a roll over and look at that every morning and know that it can whoop me in golf. Yeah, that's terrible. The scratch yeah. golf that would be that would be tough there. But uh, what's your advice on uh, for those right now who may be going? I don't think I'm ever going to find anybody, and I need some. I need some wisdom about what should I look for in a person. Well, I think it's more, it, it, I don't know if it's finding the right person. I think if you are the right person, that someone will compliment that. Because it, I, what I find with my wife is that it's the easiest relationship in the world. I don't think relationships should be tough. You're best friends. And if you are there to think ahead of the next person, of that person, then that's what love is. Love is an action. You're always thinking ahead for the next person. Um, and you're essentially trying to say, how do I make them a saint? You know, and it's all you have to do. And so I think if you try to be the right person, you will find the right person. If you're out there looking and, you know, uh, you know you, you're going to end up playing catch-up baseball all the time because the person you're looking for will always be better than you. That's right. So if you be the right person, if you be the right person... <laughs> then you'll find the right person. And so finally, I'll end things because we are closing out. But I will end things with the greatest advice. And in the words of Peterman, the greatest advice that I have ever been given is J. Peterman. And it came at a time when I needed it the most. A time when my soul was tied into little tiny knots. I was on the back end of a 13-day Chianti binge. Demons were floating around in my head that weren't even mine. My neck felt like one gargantuan monkey fist. I was in need of spiritual renewal, but when, where, how? I decided then that I would travel off to the high country of Kathmandu with a team of Sherpas that had hygiene problems I don't even want to go into. But no matter, because I was there in search of a man known only as his hisness. A man so spiritual it is said that he actually won a staring competition with his own reflection. 
And because that's who I was looking for, that is who I found. Seated in the corner of a small chapel, his legs conveniently folded into a Windsor knot. So I sat down next to him, staring into his ice-blue eyes for what seemed like hours until I could stand it no longer. Finally, I broke the silence by saying, Please, give me that which I have come for. And with that, he reached over and he slapped me as hard as he could across the face and said, Go fish. Well, I was astounded by the words I had heard. Go fish. Was this a lesson that my soul had been longing to hear? Go fish, the name of a children's card game. Or was I on the receiving end of the old Tibetan shimsha? Well, I could not be certain. And so, on my way out, I toilet-papered his pagoda. <laughs> but his words have echoed thus in my mind ever since, and now any time that my soul is tied into knots, I simply stop what I'm doing. I put down my belongings. I smile gently to myself. And I go fish. Because you see, what he was trying to tell me was to stop worrying about the future and stop living in the past. The future will take care of itself. And the past is but a faded memory and of no importance anymore. But learn instead to find the thousand joys of living in the present moment. And why? Because that's where the fish are. So I share that with you in hopes that you will remember that, that your life will be filled with a thousand joys and a great deal of fishing. If only we had a sponsor with a fishing company, that would be the perfect segue. <laughs> that was. <laughs> I am absolutely astounded. Um, that was amazing. Thank you. I don't know if I'm thanking Jay Peterman or John O'Hurley for that. Doesn't matter. They're, they're indistinguishable. They're indis sadly indistinguishable. Um, would uh, Would you do me one more honor? Would you uh, have Mr. Peterman say thank you for camping with us today? And mm. I normally close off the show, and because mm -hmm. you just basically came in and cut my bed by a fourth, um, <laughs> I have, I find myself unable to respond <laughs> to that. So you might as well, you know, why don't you just take the bus and start hosting the show, and I'll <laughs> go back to your fine home. <laughs> so. Yes, as we sit here in twilight, waiting for the little naked natives of Bantu Best to show up for our tribal ritual of closing out another day, we say good well, Godspeed. And in the words of J. Peterman, bear forward. Thanks for joining us, folks. If you want to help us out, and we're confident you do, go ahead and hit that subscribe button here on our YouTube channel. And if you ever feel like just listening to these, you can check us out on all major podcast streaming platforms by just searching for I Went Camping With. And there, you should also subscribe. Thanks again, folks.